Hello and welcome to Form First Podcast. My name is Laura. I'm one of the founders of Form First Fitness app. In this podcast, we cover topics ranging from health, fitness, injury prevention, and how technology can help us as athletes get better while staying healthy. We boil down complex science topics, bringing you the latest research from the field of fitness and technology, and basically helping you be a more educated athlete by bringing best practices and sustainability to your training. So join me today for another episode of Form First Podcast, where I'm going to be telling you a little bit more about the history of indoor rowing. It's a very exciting topic, and I can't wait to start. Let's go. Hello, guys. I'm super excited to be talking to you today about the history of indoor rowing. I think this is just such a fantastic topic and I really hope that you're going to enjoy all the facts and um, interesting dates and names we're going to be sharing with you today. So stay tuned. It's going to be epic. I promise. You guys probably don't know, but we're actually a tech company and our product is a mobile application that uses state-of-the-art AI and visual intelligence to analyze the athlete's movement and offers actionable feedback on their form. Our application is actually solely focused on indoor rowing and we offer uh, rowers the opportunity to track and analyze metrics such as seat and handle max speed, seat timing, rhythm, seat stationary percentage, seat rhythm, um, amongst others actually. And don't worry about it, we're going to be doing another separate episode just talking about the application and the technology and how it works. And we're also going to be telling you a little bit about the pre-launch that we're doing as we are actually hoping to get some of you beautiful people as part of our test group to help us co-create and kind of tweak the application before we actually end up releasing it on the market. So stay tuned on this, but we're going to tell you a little bit more in the next episode. And now back to rowing. As a tech company, we are often focused on the latest trends and innovations, and we stare far into the future. And this is totally fine. But today, we decided to take a little bit different approach on rowing and look into how, when and where indoor rowing began. I will take a little trip in time, but also a trip around the world and see how multiple innovations have made indoor rowing the sport that we know today. We're running a little bit differently the podcast today. So first, of course, I'm on my own. Peter's not here, sadly. But second, we wanted to share with you all the exciting images and facts that we have collected through our research today. So we have prepared a small presentation and a few visuals for you. So if you're watching our podcast on YouTube, you should be able to follow along as we travel in time through the history of indoor rowing and enjoy the beautiful visuals of all those historic inventions. And if you're listening anywhere else, don't worry about it. We got you covered. Of course, we're going to be uploading all the images on our website and our Facebook page. So you can just go and check it out there after you're done listening. If you like this podcast, it will be super helpful if you guys subscribe so we can spread the word and get it out there. Also, you can join our Facebook group, Form First app, so you don't miss out on any of the cool content we post all the time. Indoor rowing. It's surprising. I was absolutely stunned of like what a long, long history indoor rowing has. Actually, indoor rowing started surprisingly way back in time in ancient Greece. The first indoor rower dates back to 4th century BC and was actually developed in Athens as a tool to aid military training among sailors and soldiers. And these first rowers were built from wooden frames on shores so that unaccustomed oarsmen could learn appropriate rowing techniques before their sea expeditions. As you can imagine, a lot of those soldiers couldn't really swim, but these machines actually helped them prepare not only for the rowing, but to kind of get the experience of what would be on the boat 
and like staying and working on the boat as they're traveling on um, on their expeditions. There are no drawings of the frames used. However, there is a beautiful and very rare stone depiction of how the inside of a tree rim appears dating from around that time. A tree rim is an ancient vessel and a type of galley that was used by ancient maritime civilizations of the Mediterranean and especially Phoenicians, Asian Greeks and Romans. The tree rims derives its name from the three rows of oars manned with one man per oar and it was the most sophisticated vessel at the time. And if you actually go to our website or if you're following on our YouTube channel, you should be able to see that boat and you're gonna go, yeah, I know what you mean because it's a very, very popular imagery of that time. And it is absolutely astounding that people actually started practicing rowing on dry land since, since that time. It's pretty, pretty amazing. So it is not quite clear how exactly rowers evolved in the next century, but historic data highlights that the first modern rowing machine design appeared in the 19th century. This time that was done in the US and it was patent by W.B. Curtis in 1871. He designed the first hydraulic-based damper rowing machine, and the innovation came from usage of the flywheel and a ratchet system placed on, on board. Even though the model was quite basic and the movements of the handles were not very fluid, nor it did emulate the motion of the actual rowing, the design remained popular until the first part of the 20th century. This was an astounding innovation for its time as it allowed much further innovation to take place in the coming decades. And they use a flywheel more than just to the test of time. Many of the indoor rowing machines are created today still use the flywheel design. Some very popular examples, of course, are the indoor, indoor rowing machines created by Concept2, which is, of course, inarguably the industry market leader. Going back to the 19th century, the next big step to the development of modern rowing machines came about 30 years after W.B. Curtis's hydraulic rower from 1871. The invasion came from Rhode Island, where the first hydraulic rower was created by Narexed Machine Company, this time using a linear pneumatic resistance. In contrast to Curtis's rower, which had an extremely heavy flywheel and produced a somewhat choppy movement, this one was sturdy and reliable. Of course, it soon became the most popular machine in the field. Although the rower was large in size and quite heavy, it was actually the first machine to be sold in gyms, university, and often it for home usage for the next half a century. And despite it is sophist it's sophisticated for the time, of course, pressurized gas system design, the machine still failed to mimic the rowing motion and measuring the output of the rower. However, this gave a huge boost to the sport due to the vast adoption and the fact that this machine was actually heavily used for off-season training of university rowing teams. In the upcoming decades, indoor rowing became popular worldwide and people from all over the world started to improve on the existing models of the machines. Thus, the next big indoor rower design appeared between the 1950s and the 1960s using a large iron flywheel and a mechanical friction brake design. This new design was created by John Harrison and Leichhardt Rowing Club in Sydney and it was in fact the very first indoor rowing machine capable of accurately quantifying human power output with an accurate range of less than 1%. In the following decade, the next significant innovation came this time from Norway, when Gessing Nilsson developed the first ergometer that was using a friction braking system and industrial straps over the rim of the flywheel. At this point, the machine was considered the best available and most accurate for its time. By the beginning of the 1980s, the first air-resistant indoor rower was la launched by Repco, an Australian automotive engineering company, allowing a new generation of indoor rowing machines that were more efficient and more convenient to appear on the market. Among them, of course, were also the famous Concept2 rowers introduced by Dick and Peter Dreisigacker 
in 1981. Their machines soon became extremely popular, not only to the university, but also gyms and quite often for people to actually take and train at home. From the 1982, the history of indoor rowing machines took a completely new turn, since this was the moment when indoor rowing competitions appeared due to a handful of college students from the Cambridge, Massachusetts University, who decided to use the available machines for an informal competition. The idea soon spread it across the country, resulting in the World Indoor Rowing Championship that we all know and love today. In 1988, a Dutch engineer called Casper Rikers developed the first rowing simulator using a resistant tool mounted on bearings alongside the bar that carried the rower so that the movement was aligned with the rower's actual mass. If you think about it, it is absolutely amazing of how rowers have evolved in the past century and especially in the past 30 years. Moving all the way from the first modern rower that used the flywheel and then trying to get all that movement more accurately to mimic more real on the boat rowing and of course adding the measurement of power output. And it is absolutely fantastic of all those innovations came about and how they traveled, of course, around the world to to make rowing the sport that we all know. And we finally arriving in present day. Of course, nowadays, Concept2 is the best-selling indoor rowing brand worldwide, being followed by other respected brands that we know, such as Water Rower, Stamina Air, and Velocity Exercise Magnetic. Of course, all the brands produce different resistance um, options, such as resistance of water, air, hydraulic resistance, and magnetic. And I think it's worth mentioning to say that out of all those, the magnetic possibly is the quietest, and the hydraulic is probably considered the most cost-effective. However, of course, all the brands mentioned offer different options, and depending on the technology that you prefer, and of course, your personal budget and personal preferences. I mean, if you do rowing, I don't have to sell you of how good it is, but I think it's worth mentioning that nowadays people at all fitness levels use rowing more and more, and it often ends up replacing spinning classes or treadmill time due to the benefit of the exercise for the entire body. And if you don't know rowing, and if you're not yet sold of how indoor rowing is super cool, I'll tell you some of those benefits. And that will be you're going to improve your cardiovascular endurance. You're going to get some extra strength. You're going to develop a better capacity to absorb and transport oxygen. Of course, some weight loss. And you're getting a full body training in one exercise. And I sounds like a salesperson for rowing, but I think rowing is amazing. So if you're not solved, go read more about it because it's the best. And it is really amazing to see how indoor rowing is evolved through time and and not only about all the innovation, but how the sport has become what it is today and how all the innovations have traveled the world as rowing has. And it keeps uniting athletes from all levels, age and background. I just wanna say how much we enjoyed doing the research for this podcast and of course recording it. And I hope that you guys enjoyed listening to it and you learned something new. If you did not follow along on our YouTube channel, make sure you check out all the beautiful images we have sourced out for you on our website, formfirst.app. We would love to hear your thoughts and your comments, and maybe you can tell us if we missed something out. Maybe there is an important event in the recent history of indoor rowing that you think, you know, should have been included, or do you think that some of those events are maybe less important to mention and we should have left them out or whatever? I mean... Just, we would love to hear what you think. So don't forget to comment. Thank you again for tuning in for another episode of Forum First Podcast. I'm Laura, and I hope to see you next week. Bye.